the number one factor in cleaning is going to be your chemistry, the right type of chemistry, and the proper amount for the, for the job. So this is probably the singular most important thing we will discuss is chemistry in the process. Uh, the job of a soap is to dislodge and dissolve surface contamination so that the ultrasonic bubble can get up underneath the contaminant and take it off the, the part. Not all soaps work in an ultrasonic tank. You have to have surfactants. What a surfactant means is it makes the water wetter or it lowers the surface tension of the water. So if I've got a chemistry, and I'll give you an example, bleach. Bleach is a terrible, terrible chemistry for ultrasonics because it does not allow the bubble to cavitate. So the machine will be operational, you just won't hear any activity, and you won't see any cavitation energy in the tank because the bleach raises the surface tension of the water. So it's important that when you're cleaning that you ha you're using a chemistry that works with an ultrasonic tank that has a proper amount of surfactants. Another interesting thing about ultrasound is, is as the day wears on and your water gets dirtier, your ultrasonic activity actually increases. And the reason for that is dirt is a surfactant. So it actually, as the water gets dirtier and blacker, we actually create a stronger bubble. What's doing the chemical cleaning is the pH level. So what, that'll be something we monitor, and we'll talk about that, and I'll show you how we're going to monitor that in the tank at, at, uh, later on. Never mix chemicals unless uh, the manufacturer says these two types of chemistries are able to be mixed. And that's a very, very rare exception that I'll show you in just a moment when we look at a pH chart. Different soaps work for different applications and materials. So when we were talking about rusty tools, it's actually a two-soap, two-step process. I'm going to use an alkaline soap for the soot. I'm going to use more of an acidic product for, to remove the rust. Always wear PPE gear, gloves, uh, aprons, eyewear when you're working with chemicals. Uh, not, they are all water-based, but they have a high pH or a low pH. Uh, our bodies are predominantly made of water, which is seven to seven and a half. The chemistries could be anywhere from a three, maybe as high as a 13. So we just want to avoid getting uh, the, the soap directly in our eyes because it'll sting. pH meters, we use pH meters to record the amount of soap that we have for this particular project. So here is how we properly, and we will demonstrate this later, but the proper way to add soap is we will use guidelines that I'll give you. We're going to add the proper amount of soap to the job. We are then going to mix the chemistry in the tank, hot water with the chemistry. We're going to fill up a spray bottle. And we're going to take items from the fire, and we're going to test them with the spray bottle. We're going to spray them. We're going to spray this mixture of soap and water onto our, onto our contents. And we're going to see if the soot starts to emulsify, or if I take my index finger and lightly rub on it, what should happen is that black soot should emulsify, should break down. If it does, then I have enough soap for this particular job. Because as you all know, not, no two fires are exactly the same. Some fires are protein fires, some are electrical fires, some burn hotter than others. So depending on the, the soot level, the contamination level will dictate how much soap I need. So what I don't want anybody to get locked into is that they have to hit a certain pH number on their pH meter. You have to mechanically test. So the way you mechanically test is, again, mixing the soap and hot water into a spray bottle and testing on different parts from the fire to make sure you have enough soap to break down that chemistry. And then at that point, we'll test with our pH meter, and we'll record that number, whatever that number is. And then every two hours, that breaks, you know, uh, mid-morning breaks, lunch break, afternoon break, end of the day, we'll take our pH meter, we'll take a quick reading, and what we're looking for is we're looking to see, does my pH level drop, which it will, because soot is acidic. So if I'm cleaning at a, a higher uh, alkalinity level, when I drop a half a point is when I want to add additional soap. And so rule of thumb, and none of these are absolutes, rule of thumb is to add one-third as much soap as you originally put into the tank. So if an ex as an example, we used a gallon and a half of soap to start out, and that was appropriate for this particular job that we were working on. When we find that our pH drops a half a point, we'll add 
basically a half a gallon, a third as much, and then we'll test and to see if the pH bumps back up. Generally, I will, only, I will only recharge the tank twice before I drain the tank and start with a fresh batch of water. Uh, a couple of quick chemistry and, and uh, volume things to keep in mind. There are 128 ounces in a gallon. That will be important a little bit later on, so when we talk about ratios. So if we say two ounces per gallon, so two ounces of soap per gallon, that's a one to 64 ratio. You'll see that in, the, in, some, of the, uh, in some of the recipes. So Omega Smoke is what we use for soot and dirt removal. So as a concentrate coming out of the bottle, it's going to be a, about a 13 pH, so a fairly strong pH. AquaClean LPH, and the LPH stands for low pH, we're gonna use that for more of our delicates on our electronics. So if we have a job where we've got a lot of electronics or we've got a lot of, a lot of delicate hand-painted figurines or glass figurines, we would probably start that bath out with just the LPH and not the Omega Smoke. And then once we move to the general contents, we could, we could here's where I can mix chemistry. I will add the Omega Smoke that's a, a 13 pH because I'm in that same pH family. That's the only exception to that rule. I never mix, I would never mix a descaler, which I use for rust removal, with a smoke, which I use for soot removal because I'm on the opposite side of the spectrum. Ultimately, what I'm gonna get is I'm gonna get neutralized water that's good for nothing and I can't even drink it. It's not even good for drinking. So it's just, it's basically wasted water. So I will combine these two in a, in, on occasion. But if I'm doing a job that's got just a little bit of electrical, if you like a toaster oven or two, and I just have a little bit of delicate, I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to charge the tank with AquaClean. I'm just going to go Omega Smoke and, and away I go. That's going to be 90% of the time you're just going to use the Omega Smoke. That'll be your, your go-to product in cleaning for fire jobs. If you have products, generally when you come out of the system, you're going to find that most items are will not have a smell. You've taken the, the odor out. The exception to that would be things that are porous. Almost never on contents will you have to take the contents and put them overnight into an ozone room or a hydroxyl room or any number of uh, deodorization chambers. Most of what comes through the process will smell, will smell neutralized. So a pH chart. So again, this is a little chemistry, and it's, but it's important to know. So when our uh, omega smoke is going to be in this 13 range, which is basically like an oven cleaner. Now, uh, water is seven, so that pure water is gonna be seven, seven to seven and a half is neutral. And then if we're talking about the descaler, we're gonna be more in the orange juice range. So why you need a, a, an acid, and these, the, the product we use is an organic acid, but you need an acid because it actually etches away as the surface level off the, off the, or etches away a surface, the top layer surface off the metal. That's how we get the rust off. Again, that's predominantly gonna be used for, for tools. So once in a great while, you'll have an, a situation where you'll have a tool fire. But for the most part, we're cleaning up in this higher pH range. So that's called al uh, an alkaline range. And again, to, re to repeat, when I'm cleaning soot, soot is acidic. So if I'm putting acidic contents into an alkaline bath, what will happen is that pH level is going to drop. When I drop a half a point in my original test, that's when I need to add more soap. So a couple, a couple of formulas, but you won't really have to remember any of this. If you ever get confused, the, the formula for gallons is length times width times the liquid depth divided by 231 equals gallons. But we've done the math for you. So we sell two products in this market. We sell the 5200 system, which is 86 gallons of fluid, or the 3600 package, which is 60 gallons of fluid. So if I have a light fire, again, these are not absolutes. Again, you always have to test, but these are starting points. If I have a very, very light fire, I'm gonna use one ounce per gallon. If I've got a medium fire, your average run-of-the-mill fire, typical fire that you're gonna see six, seven out of 10 times, we're gonna start with two ounces of soap per gallon of water. And if I have a heavy fire, I'm probably gonna start at four ounces a gallon, and that still may be, not be enough. Again, I still always have to test. So in the book, and, you'll, and you will all have a, <clears throat> an ultrasonic restoration workbook, on page 10, 
we break down how many gallons of soap you need. So it tells you medium fire, two ounces per gallon. If you have a 5200 system, you're adding a gallon and a half of soap. So if you don't remember the formula, if you don't remember 128 ounces is a gallon, and the ratio of two ounces per gallon of soap, if you don't remember any of that, you don't have to. It's all on, on page 10. That really breaks it down into, it tells you exactly how much soap you need. Now, that is not necessarily how much soap you're going to need for this particular job. That is a starting point. Again, I'm going to repeat this, and I'm only repeating this because it is so critically important. You have to test that particular ratio on the contents you're cleaning, mechanically spraying it on the item and rubbing it with your index finger if the soap, and to, just to make sure that that soot emulsifies. If it does, then I take my pH reading. If it does not, maybe I'll add another, another ounce per gallon, so another, in a 5200 system, maybe another half a gallon. And I'm gonna repeat the test until I get a good breakdown of the soot. And at that point, I take my pH reading. And then that becomes the official pH for that job. But it's that set of steps that you have to take. And, those, and that is described in detail on page 9 and then page 10. So we'll break it down into exactly the steps you need to take. In fact, if you look at the bottom of page 10, it tells you step by step that you have to mix the chemistry, spray it on, test it with your index finger to make sure you've got an emulsification, and then a pH test. And then again, we will typically change the chemistry after two charges. So if I start with my initial bath, eventually my pH drops, I'm gonna add some soap, bump the pH up, it's gonna drop again, because again, we're cleaning acidic items. It's gonna drop again, I'm gonna change that bath. Now here would be an exception. If I'm finishing up a job and I've got about 12 boxes to go to finish that job, it probably makes sense at that point to recharge the tank one more time and finish the job off as opposed to draining the whole tank for 12 boxes. But if I've got 40, 50 boxes to go on a job, at that point I would drain the tank and start with a fresh tank. So there's a little, there's, there's, some of these are, these are guidelines, not absolutes. You have to look at the particular job you're working on. And you'll have a feel, your technicians will have a feel as how, how difficult the job is. If it's a very heavy sooted fire, you're probably better off just draining the tank and starting with a fresh batch. If it's a lighter fire, you'll probably continue on as well. So it has to do with the contamination level and how many boxes you have left.